right, here we go. Oh, oh, actually, I it just came up on on mine. So I'll try it, and if if we get stuck again, I will um, I'll defer to you. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone uh, for having us today. Um, we're here to discuss a lot of work um, that's been ongoing over the past several months on doing an in-depth analysis of the um, Vermont Essential Health Benefit Benchmark Plan. Um, so we're here today to talk about that work um, and the analysis that we've done on several benefits and, and what our findings are. Um, so I'll just start today by discussing um, what what entail what the process entails um, and what we've been doing um, over the past few months. So, um, under federal law, um, there's currently an avenue for states to revise their benchmark plan. So, as um, several of you know, the essential health benefits are defined in federal law, and states were required um, upon the implementation of the ACA to select a benchmark plan um, that would be offered within their state. In 2019, the federal government expanded options for states to update their benchmark plan, and they laid out uh, several options states could pursue um, to make those changes. Um, the first being states could select another state's benchmark plan to substitute an, an existing plan they could replace one or more categories of their essential health benefits with another state's benefit, or they could also just select a benefit that they felt would fit well within their existing benchmark plan. And so what we're going to be talking about today is the third option here, um, looking at benefits which we could add and supplement our, uh, to our current benchmark plan. And just to note, um, the Green Mountain Care Board, the reason why we're here is the Green Mountain Care Board has jurisdiction to review and approve the benchmark plan um, to implement it within the state at the recommend recommendation of DEBA. Um, this slide just gives the statutory authority for that, um, for what I just talked about um, and some background. The last time that the Green Mountain Care Board did approve a benchmark plan was in 2015 with the original plan being approved in 2012. Um, important to note is that in 2015, no changes were made to the existing benchmark plan, and it remained and today remains the um, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, or the TBHP CDH, CDHP HMO plan. So um, I, I reviewed this before. Again, this is just some statutory citations if you're interested in learning more about the federal process and, and what's required um, under federal law. And another important note is that this work is being funded through a federal grant as well. Um, the Department uh, of Financial Regulation was awarded this grant back in September. And um, that grant, the purpose of that grant was to look at the essential health benefit package and um, see if there are any changes that need to be made to uh, enhance affordability and access for policyholders um, to better healthcare in Vermont. Um, in addition to the grant, the legislature had also asked us to look at the essential health benefit package and um, they had pinpointed certain benefits that they wanted um, the department along with AHS and other stakeholders to consider. Those benefits are hearing aids, dentures, vision care, durable medical equipment, and fertility services, and two primary care visits with no cost share. And we'll be talking about each of those benefits throughout the presentation today. The legislature also asked that when we were looking at these benefits that we assess how each benefit would uh, align with the state's all-payer accountable care organization model agreement, as well as the state health improvement plan. Some other additional benefits which we considered were enhancements to mental health and substance use disorder benefits, a preventive dental benefit. Um, the legislation had asked us to specifically look at dentures, but um, after further discussion within our working group, um, we also considered adding a preventive dental benefit, tobacco treatment, lactation consult consultations, medically tailored meals, gym membership, nutritional counseling, 
and prediabetes self-management tools. And all of these benefits were considered either because um, the group felt that they uh, would improve the plan or align it um, more consistently with the state health care reform goals, as well as um, a comparison of what other states have done to update, update their benchmark plans or existing benefits in other Northeast region um, benchmark plans. So the working group members, which um, the working group convened, I believe it was the end of June, early July of this past summer, um, consisted of members of DFR, Department of Vermont Health Access, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, Office Vermont of the Director of Health Care Reform. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if anyone heard that. Okay. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP, and those issuers were included because they are currently the two issuers who offer um, plans in the Vermont uh, health insurance market. Northeast Delta Dental, uh, the Vermont Hospital Association, Vermont Medical Society, and Vermont Legal Aid. So this just uh, this slide gives the timeline and um, an overview uh, for where we are in our process of updating the benchmark plan. So um, I believe it was last week um, we uh, reported to the legislature on um, our findings. Um, of the actuarial analysis as, long, as well as our um, working group um, right now, and it is obviously not February, but it's a little ahead of that, um, presenting to the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, we're due to update CMS in March uh, with uh, any findings or um, suggested benefit updates. There is a required public comment period um, which will also go into April. And then by April, we hope to, um, if the Green Mountain Care Board approves, um, submit any benefit changes to CMS. And once we do receive CMS approval, which will probably be in the fall of um, 2022, we would then move to implement the new plan designs uh, for January 2024 with the issuers filing with the Department of Financial Regulation in March of 2023. Any questions before I about the process before I move into the actual analysis of the benefits? Are there any questions from board members? Not saying any, Emily. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so some of you may have received a similar slide deck last slide deck last last week. Um, we have made a few uh, updates and edits to this deck, uh, mostly related to um, the estimates of the allowed costs um, which Wakely had calculated. So if you're seeing some of the numbers looking a little different, um, that's the reason. So as I mentioned before, um, the federal government has uh, laid out a test. Um, or some standards for states to follow when they are updating their benchmark plan. So states are not currently allowed to add um, whatever benefits they, they have. They need to stay within two tests, and those are called the typicality test and the generosity test. And really for purposes of our discussions today, we'll be focusing on the generosity test, which many have referred to as the ceiling um, of of the amount of benefits that a state is allowed to add to their plan. The typicality test is a requirement that when the state does um, have a new benefit package, they must find another plan which is, uh, provides a scope of benefits which is equal to um, a typical employer plan um, in our state. But again, for today, we're really going to be focusing on this generosity test, which will give us the room or the actuarial value we'll have to work within um, when we're considering adding new benefits. So uh, Wakely came on board in September. Um, the first step that they took was to review all of our state and stakeholder information input. Like I said, we had had several meetings um, during the summer where we uh, took um, in uh, information and testimony from um, several experts um, around each benefit we were considering. 
um, to make sure that not only were we looking at it from an actuarial perspective, but also looking at it um, from a health policy perspective as well. Weekly then took our current benchmark plan and compared it against um, the other benchmark plan options um, states have to um, determine which test would or which plan would serve as our um, our plan to compare for purposes of the generosity test. Um, they then priced all of the benefits we were considering to figure out um, premium impact as well as how these benefits would be utilized. And right now we're at the point where um, we are here discussing these benefits and um, some of the decisions that we have come to. Okay. Okay. Um, so as I said um, before, um, Wakely has identified and gathered plan documents for all of the eligible comparison plans. Um, in this instance, um, it was the state health employee plan, which was the most generous plan, but Wakely did do an analysis of other plans to ensure that um, it was the correct plan uh, to compare against. And um, that was then, the state plan was then used as the comparison plan for the generosity test. The way that Wakely determined that was using VCURES data uh, as well as um, some internal information which Wakely had from their ACA database um, to formulate the allowed cost and premium impacts for this analysis. Uh, an important part or important thing to note here is that the actual impact and premium impact of adding any benefit will probably vary um, by issuer. The analysis also does not include any downstream, uh, potential downstream impacts of adding a benefit. For instance, um, if you were adding hear hearing aids and it had an improved impact on healthcare utilization in some way, those impacts would not be captured in this analysis. Okay, so here is um, a comparison of the current benchmark plan against the state employer plan, again, which was determined to be the most generous plan uh, from all of the plans that we were able to compare against. The benefits which uh, were found to be more generous in the state employer plan and thus provide the room uh, for the state to consider when adding benefits were the infertility treatment, which currently in the state plan is only covered um, at a diagnostic testing level. And if uh, in the state employer plan, it includes IVF, drugs, artificial insemination, egg preservation, as well as the, the drugs that um, are associated with those treatments. The state plan also covers acupuncture. Um, the chiropractic care and rehabilitation benefit in the state employee plan are, are more generous, which then again provides some space within which the state could add benefits, uh, as well as the habilitative services, um, massage therapy, um, so the total um, allowed costs or room that the state has to work with if it wants to consider adding benefits is 0.89% to 1.59%. And the reason why there's the range there is because depending on what plan um, you, are, you are looking at, for instance, a bronze plan, obviously the impact of adding a benefit would have a lesser impact as far as the allowed cost because those plans are covering um, a, a lesser percentage of the healthcare benefits in total. Whereas if you were looking at a premium plan, um, those plans are covering a higher percentage of the total healthcare costs. So you, you would have more room to add benefits there. Okay. And again, um, Wakely evaluated the value of each benefit being considered. Um, for inclusion in the plan. Um, the comparison of newly proposed benchmark plan against the generosity test, such that the changes do not result in the new EHB plan being richer than the most generous plan included in the generosity test. So again, we cannot, if the state chooses to add benefits, we cannot exceed the generosity of the most generous plan, which again is the state health employee plan. So this slide gives um, some benefits which were looked at and will be uh, 
changed in the coming year, but not under this benchmark process. And the reason being is that these changes will address um, discriminatory benefit designs, which are actually existing in the current plan. Um, under federal law, plans are not allowed to have discriminatory provisions in benefit designs. So an example of that would be um, a, a benefit limit, which is associated with age uh, of an individual or um, the uh, disease or condition of an individual. So nutritional counseling is the first one which had a limitation based on um, a, a policyholder's status as, uh, as having diabetes. And so the benefit change there will remove um, the, the nutritional counseling limit to be unlimited, not only for those who are, who are diabetic, but it will move to being unlimited for all policyholders. Currently, the benefit has uh, a limit of three uh, nutritional counseling visits for those who uh, are not diabetic, and that will be removed. The habilitative uh, treatment benefit currently, again, has an age limit, which will also be removed. Uh, currently, it, it only applies to those under 21, and the state will be removing that to comply with federal law. Foot care is another one, which, um, again, had a limitation for uh, diabetics or not a limit for a limitation for those without diabetes, and that will be removed so that um, any any one policyholder may access that that benefit without being required to to have a certain health condition. And the last one um, is the prescribed food and nutritional uh, benefit that also has an age limit of five for um, the 100% amino acid formulas. So the department will be asking the carriers to remove that age limit. So all of these uh, benefit adjustments will be able to be made. Um, without triggering the, the benchmark process and requirement for CMS approval because they are currently out of compliance with federal law. Okay, so moving on, um, this table summarizes the benefits that we had looked at. Um, so we considered hearing coverage and the benefit design for that would cover a hearing aid exam or hearing exam, pardon me, for ch uh, children and adults and hearing aids for both years every three years. It would all, uh, the other benefit we looked at were, was in fertility services. The goal here was to match the state benefit as closely as possible. The current state benefit covers artificial insemination as well as IVF, but has a dollar limit in place, which are not allowed um, under uh, for ben the benchmark plan. So while we won't be uh, suggesting a benefit limit or sorry a dollar limit we will be suggesting the benefit be designed uh, to cover three rounds of IVF treatment as well as the artificial insemination and as I mentioned before diagnostic testing is already a covered benefit in the benchmark plan so it will just be the addition of the artificial insemination the three rounds of IVF as well as egg preservation um, the next benefit we considered is medically tailored meals um, this is a benefit while we did a lot of research um, on it and there was a lot of interest um, from the working group. Uh, it's something that I think we need to do a little bit more research on um, if it were to actually be suggested as a benefit and I will get into that um, further down in the slides. Nutritional counseling was also a benefit that we had started to look at early on in the process. Um, and while it was not priced, it was we were able to make that change and enhance the benefit, not through this benchmarking process, but through a change to make the benefit more accessible and uh, not discriminatory. And we also did look at a wellness and gym benefit, but after discussions with um, issuers as well as the working group, uh, it was determined that this benefit is currently available um, in the market. Um, if an individual wants to buy this, there are non-standard plans, I believe, that currently offer this benefit. And there were concerns, again, around um, if, if this were to be added as an essential health benefit, um, some Vermonters maybe not having a gym um, close enough to access to actually make this a meaningful benefit for those in our state. Okay, so moving on. Um, so now I'm going to kind of go into a little bit more depth on each benefit that we considered. Um, so 
the infertility, I'm sorry, this is the both of them. So the infertility treatment, again, um, is would add about 0.61% to 1.0% of allowed costs. Uh, while the hearing aid coverage as it's currently designed would add 0.05% to 0.09%. So with the, if both benefits were added in total, it would add around um, 0.65 to 1.09%. And then the total room that the state would have um, to work with where it had benefits is 0.89% to 1.59%. So if the state, for instance, in the future wanted to add additional benefits, it would have the ability to do that because adding those two benefits, again, would not use all of our room or generosity for this purpose. Um, and then to give um, the board an idea, the cost impact of adding both of these benefits would be uh, between $4.20 to $7 per member per month, um, with about, uh, on average, I'd say 40 cents of that um, being attributed to, attributed to the hearing aid coverage um, and then the rest being attributed to the infertility coverage. Okay, so as I said, um, the infertility services benefit um, would cover three cycles of in vitro fertilization, um, including the evaluation, counseling, egg preservation, and other related services. Uh, important to note, it also cover um, several uh, prescription drugs which are required for these services. Uh, as well. Um, we did a comparison of um, other Northeast states to see where Vermont stood um, in relation to, to our, our states around the region and found that all states um, outside of, I believe it was Maine, um, oh, and Connecticut, um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, outside of Maine had some type of infertility coverage but as you can see from this chart, it varies widely. Um, you have Massachusetts, which covers, uh, which has a very generous benefit um, covering the artificial insemination in the IVF, but then also has um, some prior authorization restrictions, um, which relate to um, requirements to conceive during one year um, with states like New Hampshire not including the artificial insemination and IVF procedures, which, which as I mentioned, make up the bulk of the cost here, um, but covering the diagnose, diagnosis and treatment of infertility. Any questions on this chart before I move on? I have some questions, but we typically hold them to the end. So oh, I'm that's sorry. what I was okay. planning on doing. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Okay, and then here um, we've just mentioned some of the benefit considerations. Um, there can be increased claims costs uh, related to uh, maternity cycles, um, including multiple births, um, but it can also have an improved uh, impact on members' well being, including support for um, mental health and it can lead to um, improved support for organic state population growth. And this right uh, down here just gives a more broken out example of what the impact would be were um, the infertility services to be added. Um, the PMPM, PM, as I mentioned before, would range from about $3.90 to $6.50 PMPM and would have uh, a pretty low utilization. So the next benefit we looked at were the hearing aids and exams. Um, this benefit would uh, provide an adult and child ex hearing exam every year, and uh, hearing aid uh, one for each one for each year every three years. And for this benefit, we did try to mirror the current Medicaid benefit, um, which is provided in Vermont. And while the Medicaid benefit um, limitation is medically necessity medical necessity, when we looked a little deeper at the benefit and how Medicaid was determining uh, what, what was med medically ne uh, medical necessity for purposes of their benefit, we did find that they were um, limiting hearing aids to every three years. Um, and out if it was before the three years, it required a prior authorization. So um, adult hearing benefits are actually not as prevalent um, throughout the United States with only 11 states, 
explicit, explicitly requiring hearing aids. What we did find though is several states had an existing benefit for uh, uh, child hearing aids, which because of the prohibition um, on age limitations under the ACA, those states have now been required to change their benefit to also include um, adult hearing aid coverage. And so again, we did a cross comparison looking at other Northeast states and found um, most states did have a hearing aid benefit uh, with the exception of Pennsylvania. And some states again did have the three month limitation, some less, and then some states also had um, certain uh, prior off requirements such as New Hampshire having um, a requirement that if the prescription changes, the, the individual could receive hearing aids outside of the, the 60 month limit that that state has. Um, potential impacts of adding hearing aids. Um, when the group um, heard testimony or, or information um, on the benefits of adding hearing aids, there was a lot of um, information provided on its impact to um, to individuals' uh, mental well-being as well as their health, um, as well as their socioeconomic position. Um, another uh, caveat to Weekly's analysis was there, while the, the cost impact is um, determined to be pretty low, there might be pent-up demand, which would lead to higher claims utilization within the first year. So while um, inc overall increased costs are estimated to be 0 0.05 to 0 0.09. The actual impact in the first years might be um, might be higher. And again, um, like the infertility services, this benefit um, would have a pretty a low utilization among this population, um, with 0.1% to 0.2% of members um, utilizing this benefit. And the last benefit um, that the group considered um, was the medically tailored meals. And this benefit was, um, I think, chosen because of its alignment with um, a broad range of the state health care reform goals, um, as well as its potential impact to, um, to help those with chronic conditions in our state, such as um, heart disease and diabetes. Um, so while we're not proposing it or putting it forward today as a benefit. I think there was a lot of interest from the group um, on looking at this further and potentially um, looking at a pilot program within our state. There aren't currently any states um, that offer this as an essential health benefit. Um, there are some Medicare Advantage plans that have this as a benefit. Um, but uh, I think overall there was consensus that this could could be meaningful, but just more work would need to be done to figure out what what benefit design would make sense for this market. And this slide is just for discussion purposes and gives you an idea of what we did talk about um, and what a potential benefit could look like. So um, this chart um, on this slide uh, gives you an idea of the uh, cost impact um, a benefit uh, such as um, one box or one bundle of groceries could have, and then depending on the engagement, um, the cost impact. And so a few slides ago when I was talking about the room, um, we would have to add um, if, if the board or the state was interested in looking at this benefit for future, for, for a future addition, we just have to consider um, leaving enough room within our current plan to add uh, this benefit. So um, this slide just gives again uh, information on the um, allowed cost impact for purposes of the generosity test and then a breakdown of uh, what each benefit um, would have on the premium uh, for plans, a high and low estimate, and again, adding them in uh, what room we would have left uh, for purposes of, of the generosity test. So I did have um, several slides on um, non-EHB considerations, um, but I wasn't sure if the board would like to hear about 
those or if this would be a good place to stop. Any preferences, board members? <clears throat> My preference would be to hear the, the considerations. OK, great. So um, is that. Should I move on? Yes. OK, great. Um, so the non EHB considerations. So these uh, benefits, which I'll be talking about, uh, while many of them were aligned with the state health care reform goals um, and some uh, were benefits with which the legislature had asked us to consider for one reason or another, which I'll get into, um, the group either was not allowed to consider them as an essential health benefit or decided that it wasn't a good fit for our current benchmark plan. So those benefits are adult dental, adult vision, and the free primary care office visits. So the first two that I mentioned, adult dental and adult vision, those are actually not allowed um, to be considered um, as essential health benefits under federal law. And the free primary care office visits, while um, you know there, there is a lot of interest in offering um, free PCP visits at no cost share, um, because the PCP visits or primary care visits are already a covered benefit, it wouldn't be an, an additional benefit for purposes of this analysis. Another important, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> another important thing to note is that um, because these benefits are non EHBs, if the state uh, was to add them to the benefit plan, um, the state would be uh, would be on the hook or would be required to defray the cost of adding those benefits. So for the adult dental benefit, what we what the legislature had asked us to look at were um, was coverage for dentures. And after um, discussions in our working group, it was determined that um, especially for the QHP population, which is um, which is made up of individuals usually from uh, children to age 65, a denture benefit um, maybe wouldn't be the the best use of um, a dental benefit, so the group looked more towards um, offering a prevent an adult preventive benefit. And what that would include is an exam and cleaning every six months. So um, some considerations when we looked at this benefit were the dental health is often related to your physical health. Um, it's also uh, very much in alignment um, with the state health improvement plan. And uh, preventive coverage can ensure people get the proper cleaning so that they wouldn't need dentures or, or further expensive uh, dental work in the future. Um, when Wakely analyzed the cost of this benefit, it, was, it came out between 1.3% and 1.7% um, of allowed costs, um, with dentures being a lot smaller cost impact, mostly because um, as I mentioned, the age, uh, the populate, the population age for this group, um, when when you actually looked at the claims, uh, weren't using dentures as as much as an older population. Adult vision was the next benefit we looked at, and that included an eye exam and eyeglasses or contacts every two years. And again, as I mentioned before. Um, adult vision is not allowed to be included as an essential health benefit. So were the state want to want to add that benefit, they would be required to um, to pay for it. And obviously adding adult vision would have um, some serious um, impacts on quality of life. Um, and having uh, an eye exam can uh, work to for the early detection of um, ocular diseases. Um, so the cost impact uh, of this would vary greatly depending on the cost sharing. Um, so Wakely estimated that the increase in paid costs would be between 0.6% and 1.0% uh, for adult coverage. Um, important to note 
also is that currently there is a pediatric benefit for both uh, vision and dental services within uh, the benchmark plan. Um, so while um, the, the children are currently covered for vision and um, dental services, adults are not. And the last um, subject I'll touch on, which I won't get into too deeply because um, the QHP uh, uh, design standard, sorry, the standard QHP design working group is actually looking at this issue currently um, uh, of the, the impact of adding um, the two PCP visits um, to the benchmark plan. And this slide just gives you an idea <clears throat> of what the increase in actual value would have depending um, on where the the cost share was waived for those two uh, visits with obviously the bronze plan having the largest impact um, were there to be two free PCP and mental health substance uh, abuse disorder visits added. And that's it. Now I, now I can take questions. <laughs> okay. Since we started with uh, member Holmes this morning, I'm going to start with member Lunch this afternoon and go in alphabetical order, Robin. Sure, thank you. Um, Emily, I was wondering if um, the group looked at or if it's possible for Wakely to now look at uh, the potential premium impacts of the changes in the benefit adjustments due to the discriminatory rules, because while, of course, that's not, as you said, relevant to the generosity, it is relevant to the premium impacts from the decisions we will make and so be good to kind of have a sense of how much our premiums going to be going up as a result of those changes when considering these other issues. Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I do recall and maybe Wakely could help me with this when um, we looked at the nutritional counseling, for instance, because that was a benefit we were considering before we realized the benefit design might be discriminatory. I think it was a 0.0 to a 0.2% impact. And uh, Julie, maybe you could um, fill in any detail there for me. Yeah, I agree that that one will be pretty small. I think the overall cost um, of that benefit. And since it's already being covered at some level, I think yeah, the impact will be pretty small. Um, and then I think the foot care one tends to also be small. I don't think any of them are significant, but we can definitely go back and, and quant up, try and put a, a number on those. That would be terrific. Thank you, Julie. Good sure. to hear your voice. You too. Um, it's been a while. Um, and then the other question I had about the discriminatory changes is, will those go into effect for the 2023 plan year or the 2024 plan year? Those will go into effect for the 2023 plan year um, because we don't have to go through this federal process for those sure. changes. We'll be able yep. to meet with the issuers, you know, in the coming months to, to talk about those changes. I believe our, one of them has already been discussed and agreed upon. So we're hoping that that's not a heavy lift and, and we'll be able to be put in for, for next next year. Great, okay, thank you. Um, the other, on, uh, this is just really more a comment for, uh, it sounds like medically tailored meals uh, need some more work um, and uh, one area that I was wondering if you had thought about um, in your preliminary discussions is whether some some of the individuals who would be purchasing insurance through Vermont Health Connect might also be eligible for food stamps or other sorts of public benefits and whether there's any potential conflict with those other eligibility rules uh, just to so that when you're exploring it further to have an understanding of the complete impact that the family might face. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, and then I did note in your opening slide that um, you recognize that under the statute, the commissioner of DIVA uh, will, would make a recommendation to us about what benefits they he or she would, in this case, she would recommend being added. And so I'm hoping that in a future meeting, you'll be coming back with those recommendations. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, that's Those are my questions right now. I may have something as I go through my notes, but I'll pass it to the next. Thank you. 
Thank you, Robin. Next, we'll go to board member Pelham. Tom? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Emily and team for the presentation. Um, my, my first question isn't about, a, it, it's kind of about what the mission was here because I was, uh, I, I was confused and still am a little confused. Uh, um, <clears throat> the specific language in section E-227 charged the named participants, so you're basically your working, your working team, quote, to review Vermont's benchmark plan establishing the state's essential health benefits to assess whether the benchmark plan is appropriately aligned with Vermont's health care reform goals regarding population health and prevention as set forth in the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement and the Department of Health State Health Improvement Plan. Then subsequently, the law moves on um, to the consideration of specific uh, possible new benefits that the legislature was concerned with. And that sequencing made sense to me um, because, you know, um, it was kind of an approach to kind of, you know, we've had the uh, existing benchmark plan going back a decade um, uh, and to 2022. It wasn't amended in 2015, I see from your slides. And so it's, it's the basis for um, uh, going forward that is, could, um, could be, uh, may have aged well and maybe ha hasn't aged well. I don't know, um, but I thought kind of looking, I thought what the legislature was saying was go take a look. And, and another reason why I think that makes sense, maybe, or maybe I don't understand the law, is uh, that in the, in the um, creation of actuarial room, you know, uh, with the generosity, you know, being the, the ceiling, uh, and the floor being the base plan, if there are things in the base plan that just don't make sense anymore, or could be changed or modified, uh, can could we have create or could we create more actual room by uh, um, improving, updating, modifying, modernizing uh, the benchmark plan? So my question, <clears throat> um, and so uh, in your draft report, uh, not in the slideshow, but in the draft report, uh, it, it stated that, quote, for the purposes of benchmarking service exercises, the group focused on how each benefit would most fully meet the goals of providing services that are available, accessible, and affordable, while also working towards accomplishing improved health and, and social gains. So that language kind of focused on each of these uh, benefits uh, alignment with the state health plan. So my, my question, this is my question, um, and I don't have a lot of questions, so I'm taking up a lot of time with one question, um, is so did the working group explore the existing plan relative to its clinical content and utilization and find any existing benefits which could be updated, streamlined, or diminished in order to create, quote, actuarial room for replacement benefits which the legislature asked to be considered or which offer higher value uh, higher levels of benefit. Because um, I think in our two by two the other day, um, I think I asked the question, or someone asked the question, was there any benefit that was uh, um, uh, terminated or amended? Uh, in, in, and, and, the answer, and the answer was no. And further, that if there was one um, rate payer out there or, or one member of, of the QHP population that used um, a benefit that that benefit would re be retained. So that's that's kind of my broad question. Yeah. So to answer your question, we didn't look at every single benefit and how it was currently being utilized um, and the cost it was adding to the system. When we when we did start to talk about okay, which benefits would make sense to maybe take away, and we posed that question to our working group. Uh, the feedback we received was that there was no interest in, in taking a benefit away um, that's currently offered in the plan. I think I think some an exercise that could be done that might more get to um, utilization and how the plan's being used could be looking at cost share. And because cost share and um, for instance, prior authorization, other utilization management tools, I think are really what can drive 
um, individuals to use a certain benefit more than others. For instance, when we're talking about the PCP visits and adding those uh, as no cost share, that would obviously open up that benefit. But those conversations are that that type of analysis isn't necessarily relevant to the, the benchmarking exercise in a certain extent because we this, we're not looking to change the cost share. We're really looking to, as you said, uh, add take away um, or supplement a benefit. And just going back, I think the feedback that we received was that there was really no desire to take away a current benefit. And there wasn't really any benefit when we were looking at uh, the certificate of coverage that we thought would be even a candidate for exploring to take away. So that's why we really focused on looking at benefits that could be added to the plan, but then would maybe have um, a, a downward pressure on utilization of other benefits that are currently offered in the plan. And the one, again, that we went back to and that we were looking at was the, the medically tailored meals or a food prescription, where if you were to add that benefit to the plan, you could put um, you know, some downward pressure on um, those needing insulin or really expensive prescription drugs, which as we all know, have been driving um, cost increases over the years to, to uh, premiums. So we were really trying to, to focus on what benefits could we add while not taking away a benefit could maybe decrease utilization across the healthcare system and then overall uh, improve uh, policyholders' health, health. So does that, does that answer your question? Well, I, I, I get it. I just wonder, and I don't know, but I just wonder if we had a, a team of clinicians, you know, that are into evidence-based medicine and they went through our existing plan and they, and, and they, they'd look at it and say, well, why are you doing this? Or why are you doing that? And I, I just feel that that opportunity after 10 years uh, might uh, yield some, some more capacity to do other things that the legislature might want to do or that other reasonable people might do. I, I understand a working yeah. committee, uh, you know, you look at the working committee and it's it's a group of people, it's a bunch of stakeholders and I understand that. Um, but I, 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 but there's a part of me that says that after 10 years, this existing plan has got to have some inefficiencies um, that, that, that we could capitalize on. But. Yeah, Some, something else I just want to add to that, too, is that while we've been talking about the generosity test, because that's when you're adding benefits, you don't want to go over that, that ceiling, but we also have to consider that there's this typicality test. So if we were to remove benefits, um, and again, going back to 2013, when, we, when the state um, analyzed other plans that were in the market and chose the benchmark plan, while it didn't choose the richest plan at that time, which I believe was the state health employee plan, uh, but it did choose a plan that was comparable uh, in a lot of ways to other plans. So I would always also caution that if you did decide to take away benefits while maybe utilization there wasn't, you know, maybe the benefit itself didn't have a, a high uh, benefit or as high as some other benefits that could be added, I think that um, you'd also have to be careful if you were removing something that you wouldn't be able to pass um, the test that the, the federal government has laid out. And then my last point on this is that um, the essential health benefit categories um, are essential so um, and, and defined in federal law. So if we were taking something out, let's say we wanted to remove something that was adding to our uh, rehabilitative benefit, we would have to then make sure that we were putting something back in. Um, so again, when we looked across Northeast states and were doing a comparison, we, su we saw that we were pretty well matched up um, with, with our states uh, in the region. And so we wouldn't want to also fall below in any of the categories that we're looking at. And, and again, I just go back to saying, I, I do think that the benchmark plan we have, um, you know, provides provides a robust set of benefits when you compare it to other Northeast states as well. So this was trying to make sure that not only were we matching what other uh, states were doing, but trying to see if there were any holes um, that we could fill where there was a need. 
I, I get it. I, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult task. Robin yeah. explained to me. I guess she was involved in this effort way back when, and and I will say, uh, you know, on the Zoom here, or what she, uh, her, her description of it. <laughs> but uh, it, it was it was you know, it's it's a it's a tough task, and I don't env envy any of you. My my next question area is. Um, and this may not be significant, but in an earlier slide, I think it was some somewhere around slide 20, um, uh, there was just this reference to impact on premiums um, having to do with different design plans and different carriers. And um, uh, the phrase was, I wrote down the two words, some significantly could be different than kind of like the, the averages that you were showing. And so I just want to kind of, I wanted to ask, what significantly might mean because there's a part of me that says um, we've from a premium point of view we've uh, gotten to a sweet spot which you know I had hoped that we would get through a state effort but thankfully no one listened to me because the federal government did it um, in terms of um, you know uh, you know subsidies up to 500% uh, of poverty um, but I'm just wondering so there's there's folks out there um, yeah, potentially significantly in the bottom. In 2024 premiums by issues may vary potentially significantly. And I'm just worried that that Vermonters out there have experienced the, these new subsidies, and that's a good thing. Um, but then here comes some plan redesigns that eats into those subsidies uh, you know, through premiums. And uh, I just worry, do we have any sense at all as to what potentially significantly means? Yeah, so just to give you an example, um, I think especially for the infertility services being added, uh, while we've only analyzed the, the benefit itself, you could then have other costs that are associated, associated with adding that benefit. Same goes for if you add a, add a benefit that can then have, like I mentioned before, um, have you know, a downward pressure on utilization of other health care services, so it can go both ways. But I think what we just want to make sure is very clear is that if you were to add um, the hearing aids or the infertility services, there could be, uh, for instance, more uh, multiple births um, with, with the addition of the infertility services. There could be more maternity care. So, um, if you're looking for an exact percent, I don't have that, but I just think it, it's it was important to be aware that it might not just be a minor um, a minor addition uh, to the to these costs. It could be substantial. So, and Julie, I don't. Is there anything you can add to that? Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. It's it's really up to the the issuer and their actuaries in terms of what they do. Um, you know, I think, and it'll be important that you know the Green Mountain Care Board and DFR review. Um, you know, the rate filings uh, with that perspective. Um, the Oliver Wyman report that was done a bit ago on infertility did have some estimates um, on the impact of maternity costs. So that would be kind of a, a guideline there um, in terms of what those impacts would be. And, and I can say this as an actuary that I think we do tend to, to think about what the additional costs might be and for where there might be savings, I kind of say, oh, well, we'll wait for those to come in to see if they're real. So um, that's just kind of a, a bit of caution as well as that I think uh, actuaries tend to be more concerned about the, the, the risk of, of increased costs um, as opposed to being optimistic about savings. Um, also, I know as we, when we went through the hearing aid, um, we did actually some work on the hearing aid analysis um, about a year ago. And one of, uh, at least one of the issuers commented that they thought our estimates were low. Um, so we, but we actually, we've looked at the data. We actually have done hearing analysis in a couple of other states and also referenced a report that was done by a different actuarial company um, or actual firm. I believe it was for Maine. Um, and all the estimates are coming in around the same amount. So, um, so I think for hearing aids, hopefully that one's in the ballpark and fertility is one that, um, you know, may vary significantly based on what kind of downstream impacts they include, what's the age of their population. So that's also going to be, it's going to be, you know, what what does their underlying population look like if no one's in the you know, general age of, of needing um, infertility treatment that will impact the cost that they add as well. So yeah, it's kind of hard to put a number on that. Um, you know, we can try, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it really is up to the individual um, actuary for each of the companies and, and what their assumptions are. Well, that, that answer, 
uh, answers my next question, which was, I noticed that the reference on hearing aids in the report was that the a typical cost of, there was a study done that a typical cost of approximately 2,400 per single hearing aid was mm -hmm. the reference point. And I'm thinking given technology and time since 2015, uh, 2015, probably a lot has changed, but it sounds like you've been out there in the marketplace uh, trying yeah. to. Yeah. And one important caveat actually is that we did not incorporate, the, you know, there's been some, you know, the hearing aid, the over-the-counter hearing aids, you know, may significantly lower the costs. So to the extent that those become more prevalent, again, we haven't assumed that was the case because we don't want to underestimate the impact for premiums, but it is possible that that is one area where costs may come down over time. But we're, we're trying to think through kind of how, what the cost is um, today. And so my, my last, is it my last question? Maybe, maybe no, no more than two. Um, so one benefit, uh, and it was mentioned earlier in a slide and I didn't see it pop back up again, uh, which was uh, pre-diabetes workshops or the uh, self-management program. So I saw it at the beginning, but then there was nothing in the slide. So let me read you my spiel here so that you'll see where I'm coming from. Um, <clears throat> One benefit that would be fully in accord with both the state health improvement plan and population health goals of the APM would be the inclusion of the CDC's well-regarded and established national diabetes prevention program as a benefit. Diabetes is an expensive killer. Um, and according to the Department of Health, it is one of four chronic diseases that are the cause of more than 50% of the deaths in Vermont each year. 9% of Vermonters suffer from diabetes and it's ex expensive. According to this year's, according to Blue Cross Blue Shield Silver Plan profile, Joe's type two diabetes costs the healthcare system $5,600 annually and $2,290 out of pocket in addition to premiums. Engagement in a CDC prevention program would be far more, or more cost effective. My understanding is the Blueprint self-management program offer CDC uh, program, but on a very thin budget. Given that nutrition counseling may become more accessible due to fixing a discriminatory benefit design and likely thus not be uh, considered as a change in, um, <clears throat> in uh, essential health benefits plan, isn't it the opportune time to maintain uh, mainstream, mainstream the CD's diabetes prevention program by embedding such as a covered benefit in the benchmark plan. So that, I, I mean, this, the, I mean, I mean, here we have a killer. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, and the wind, you know, uh, you know, and eight or 9% of Vermonters already suffer from diabetes. Doesn't it make sense to, to uh, put wind in the sail of, 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 you know, by ha having as a direct benefit um, in, in the benchmark plan. And yes, there would be some reorganizing, you know, maybe physical therapists and uh, uh, nutrition people, you know, will we'll, we'll need to get together to kind of sponsor these, uh, but, but, but let's grow in Vermont, let's grow the number of people, the number of entities, the number of providers that are providing this um, CDC plan, which is well-established and everybody says, you know, it, 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 it cuts, um, you know, diabetes rates by people who to participate in it in, 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 in mid double digits. So it works. And I, th this is one thing I just, well, I just don't get it. I, 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 I don't, um, I don't see why, um, well, I, I've given you my spiel. I, I don't get yeah, it. This, yeah. this is a big miss for, miss to me. Well, and, and I want to apologize uh, for, I actually want to return to that slide um, and thank you for, for bringing that up. But I think I'll um, now pass it to um, Ina Bacchus to respond to your question. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Pellum, as you pointed out, the Blueprint for Health program is required to provide education for patients on how to manage conditions or diseases, including the prevention of disease and um, that the blueprint is also required to provide programs to modify patient behavior and methods of ensuring compliance with uh, patient behavior change. And these offerings uh, have been available through the blueprint program um, 
for many years. The Blueprint supports chronic disease self-management workshops and these self-management programs have also been supported by the Vermont Department of Health. The Department of Health supports the training of program leaders and marketing to potential participants in these workshops. The workshops are available to any Vermonter regardless of their insurance coverage, regardless of the payer, uh, and that creates a low barrier to access for providers who might want to prescribe or suggest participation in these workshops. Uh, it, it creates fewer barriers for the providers, fewer barriers for the Vermonters who might want to register for these workshops. The Blueprint uh, for Health program um, has looked at the efficacy of these workshops and how to improve them in collaboration with stakeholders. And recently in the fall, um, late September, um, after that stakeholder input, determined that the Agency of Human Services um, Department of Health uh, collaborating with the Blueprint uh, should take on the management um, of these self-management programs. So the Blueprint for Health has endeavored in an MOU with the Department of Health um, to uh, provide for the self-management programs. The Department of Health, um, consistent with its obligation uh, per the CDC and also consistent with its uh, mission, is providing more resources for this programming. You can go to the Healthy Vermont um, webs or My Healthy Vermont, excuse me, uh, webpage, and you can find a number of self-management programs to include the federally uh, approved pre-diabetes self-management program available. Um, the programs in particular now are available statewide. They have moved online um, in the era of COVID-19 and Vermonters statewide can um, participate in this programming, again, at no cost. The um, programming, um, we will be monitoring uh, this transition, evaluating the administration of these programs, and particularly um, looking to see how these programs are further modernized. I think there was a lot of appetite for these this programming to um, move online and when that happened due to COVID-19, I believe that was welcome for many individuals and increased access to the programming. However, there are folks who um, prefer the in-person workshops and those are planned to return in combination with the online programming. So as we um, are new in this relationship with the Department of Health to improve the, the programming and offerings, and to refresh and modernize. Again, we'll be monitoring throughout the year, and we may be um, you know, making further recommendations in how these programs are supported and continue to be expanded in their access. On the My Healthy Vermont webpage, you can um, you can see that there are uh, numerous um, pre-diabetes uh, self-management offerings currently open for sign up. The program takes uh, the program is available and is a year long uh, program with 12 sessions um, for a person to enroll and participate in as one as one example. Well, you know, I, I, I understand that I just um, um, I, I just, you know, I just think it's a more powerful relationship when a benefit is part of an insurance plan and a doctor, primary care physician can say to their um, patient, um, you're pre-diabetic and uh, you should you know, enroll in this program, whether it's sponsored by the Department of Health or privately, uh, but you should enroll in, in, in someone certified to provide this CDC program you know, to to cut your chances of getting your diabetic. I, I, I fully understand what you're saying. I just think by 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 embedding embedding uh, um, access to this plan, both financially but substantively, it's a much more direct and powerful relationship.
for a chronic disease that's at the top the, that's at the top of the list. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I just I just think that it's you know it's it's still kind of buried in the in, in the bureaucracy. I've been to the website that you talked. It's a very nice website, but you kind of got to find your way there. Where as opposed to being sent there by your primary care care or sent to a program by the primary care physician. So I'll I'll leave it at that. I have one last quick question. Um, <clears throat> this had to do with gen membership and nothing to do with with uh, uh, the uh, with diabetes, but I, it just caught my eye. A, um, in the report, it says, "quote A gen membership benefit was also considered and not recommended at this time due to concerns." around geographic equity, I can kind of understand that one, cost maybe, as well as the benefit currently being offered under some non-standard plans. And I just wondered why would a benefit being offered under some non-standard plans be a limitation, uh, whether it's good or not, be a limitation to a benefit being in uh, the standard plan? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I don't really view it as a limitation, but a concern uh, we heard from the issuers when um, some of the benefits that we looked at was that part of the non-standard plans, as you know, is to offer uh, a plan design that might be different from their competitors. And so that can maybe draw um, people who, for instance, really value a gym membership that might draw them to uh, one carrier or the other. So I think they liked having uh, the flexibility to design that benefit in a way that would make them more competitive in the market. And because the benefit was available, we thought, and, and with the other concerns that we mentioned, we thought that it, it is available. And if, if someone really wants that benefit, they can now purchase a plan that has it, um, or they might want to buy a plan. For instance, one of the plans we looked at had more of like a wellness amount or like an amount of money that maybe you didn't have to spend at a gym, but you could put it towards like a yoga class or a different type of, of wellness activity. Like you wanted to buy a ski pass or something like that. So you could put money towards different healthy activities. So we just thought that the, the benefit was being served in some ways already in the market and because of those, those equity concerns, and I can even speak to myself, not having a gym, um, close by or accessible to me, um, that we thought that because it was available and our other concerns that it was best not to consider it for now. No. Well, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I just think that that generally as a, the, you know, the, the kind of public folks should be blind to the, the competitive interests of, of some of the carriers. And so that phrase caught me that, you know, there might be people in a whole bunch of other different plans and and people out there that don't want to you know go buy a plan specifically for that a gym membership you know there's i um, i don't think people may, are making their decisions about the insurance uh plan that they engage based on a gym membership but if but i don't think we should be making decisions based on um uh one plan offering a gym membership and another plan not so thank you very yeah, much yeah. for your Quite patience safe. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move to board member Walsh. Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think you've, uh, well, thanks for all the work that you've done. It's been very enlightening. Um, and I, I think some of the questions that Tom just had previously, um, I was thinking along the same lines. Um, the existing plan is, is a, a decade old. And I was wondering if you had um, kind of combed through that with some uh, greater understanding of ways of utilization management, I think is what you called it, but with the behavioral economics behind it with nudges and you know, loss aversion type of things. Have you gone through that exercise to see if it's possible to free up more for newer additions? And it sounded like in your response to Tom's question that you had. And if that's the case, I think it would be beneficial to just show that, kind of show the work behind that about how you came to the base model for this exercise. Um, that might be, um, 
it might help in understanding the work that you've done to, to arrive at the base and to see what's available to kind of play with. Yeah, and I, so I, if I understand what you're saying, it, I, we have not done kind of a, a claim by claim analysis to see where, what benefit is being utilized by how many people and the cost. We have not done that, but I think overall the consensus of the group was that there wasn't necessarily a benefit that even if it was maybe not utilized as heavy as other benefits didn't have some value uh, as being included in the plan. So we didn't really go down the road of saying, okay, what, what, how is this benefit being utilized? We didn't do that in-depth analysis of, and what are the, what are the health outcomes for all of the benefits? And again, that is something we can go back and, and look at, but for, for purposes of this exercise, and then also to stay within, um, within the uh, grant specifications, because again, this money has to be used for certain purposes. So we also kept, we're keeping that in mind when we were doing this analysis and tried to kind of meld the legislative mandate as well as we could with also um, the federal requirements that we were being subjected to for, for, for this analysis. Um, but again, I think, I think that work that you're talking about would be really, um, would be really great to do, not only in the context of how the benefits are being used, but then as you said, where, where, where are the utilization management tools being used and could those shift, whether that's prior authorization requirements, um, cost share, uh, all of those things I think need to be looked at together, whereas we were just really looking at the benefits. So, so I think definitely like a great idea, but needed, would need to be done in, in, a, in a larger context of looking at other issues that were kind of outside of our, our scope here, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm new, so I'm just kind of coming to, yeah. to learn about all of these things and and what's your purview. And I don't want to send you on a on a on a wild goose chase, but it just seems like with something that's a decade old, is it tweakable to to then free up or to make available funds for something something else where there's yeah. a big impact? Tom's example with diabetes is spot on. And with that freeing up, it kind of leads into my second question comment. It's um, in in looking at what we what could be available to modernize the new plan. Um, I imagine you've done this, and I just I think it would be really helpful to show. But kind of looking through those possibilities with a little through an equity lens, right? That that are we helping Vermonters who need the most help the most? Right when we think of something like a dental benefit, and I know there are federal limitations around that, I'm I'm coming to learn there are federal limitations around that. But if we're looking at that compared to infertility treatments, for example, um, being able to um, describe why we're making the decisions we are after we've looked for ways to improve upon the base and looking through the process through an equity lens, I, I think um, that would be helpful. Yeah, and I, I didn't outline it in these slides, but if you um, refer to the report that um, member Pelham brought up, um, there are there is some discussion in there about equity and we definitely, that was pretty uh, forward in a lot of our discussions, um, especially with the hearing aid benefit and bringing equity, equity to people who, who have a disability and um, some of who aren't able to get um, hearing aids to uh, to put them kind of on an even footing with with others um, in the market currently. So it was definitely something we considered and, and looked at the tried to look at the benefits through that through that equity lens, as you said. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Next, we'll go to Board Member Holmes, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Emily and team, big team this year for coming in. Um, I just have a couple of comments. I don't really have questions. Uh, one is I really just want to echo my uh, fellow board members there on the equity lens. I think it's really important to think about those benefits and, and if they are disproportionately going to impact our lowest income, most vulnerable Vermonters, that probably has to have more weight. Um, and so I think about that when I think about dental, when I think about that with vision and when I think about that with hearing. Uh, 
in terms of, I just want to make a, two, two quick comments. One is on actually the geographic equity around the gym membership. I'll just, this is just a side comment, but if more insurance plans subsidize gyms, you'd probably see more gyms being built and you actually might be able to you know, reduce the inequities of, of gym availability. So I'll just say yeah. it can actually work in, in the favor of trying to reduce uh, you know, equity and access. Um, and the second comment I will make is just that, uh, and it relates to the infertility, um, and, and you alluded to this and you talked about it a little bit, but you know, for us to really think about whether that should be added to the benchmark plan, um, I would really, as one board member, I'm speaking as one board member now, I'd really need to understand the full cost of that infertility treatment. And I mean that beyond, yes, there's the, the three rounds of IVF and then there's the artificial insemination, but what are the downstream costs? And I recognize, you know, Julie, you mentioned that there's an Oliver Wyman report um, and, and that, that that full calculation hadn't been made, but there's multiple childbirths, there's complications associated often with multiple childbirths, there are downstream costs. And I think just to be fair, if we're truly trying to look for the costs and benefits of adding this to the benchmark plan, we have to have a full accounting of those costs. So I know, Emily, you're coming back and I appreciate that you're coming back with recommendations. Um, Maybe in those recommendations, you can include some of the Oliver Wyman estimates of what the full downstream costs might yep. be. You can make a really informed decision about that. Those are my yep, two. I, I can do that. Thank you. Okay, at this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment on the. Kevin, uh, I have uh, another, I have a quick follow up. Sorry. Sure, go ahead, Robin. Yeah. Um, Ina, this is uh, related to the blueprint programs. I wonder if when you are thinking about um, the refresh of these programs, uh, getting more additional information to Tom's point about. Uh, just a sec, Robin. Um, Tom P, can you mute yourself? There's some feedback coming through your line. Go ahead, Robin. Sure. Uh, the power of the referral from the primary care physician. Um, at one point, certainly the Blueprint self-management programs, you would see the posters related to those in your primary care doctor's office. So I'm wondering if that relationship piece is something that could be bolstered to Tom's point, which I think, you know, to me, it's that referral and that relationship which has the power um, and the availability and making sure that the funding is sufficient. Um, more than, the embedded necessarily in the insurance plan. The embedding in the insurance plan is potentially a, a, a funding source, but um, currently the blueprint does get funding from insurers. So there may be an alternative way to uh, provide additional funding should that be needed for that program. So um, I just wanted to, that's not really a question, just a comment and to think about how we can ensure that the the programs really get embedded in the primary care office. Thank you, Robin. At this point, we're going to go to public comment. Does any member of the public wish to offer a comment on the essential health benefits discussion? Walter Carpenter. Good afternoon, Walter. Hey, Kevin. How you doing? Hanging in there. Hey, too, I suppose. As usual, I think I, I <clears throat> agree with Tom Pelham's comments um, and some of the board members and Jessica as well, so I'm, especially about the gym memberships. And I think one of the things about the gym memberships is that <clears throat> the biggest hurdle to that is simple poverty in Vermont. It's not just building more gym members, is that nobody can afford it to begin with. I don't belong to a gym, but I happen to work at a ski area. And because <clears throat> a gym, you know, is too expensive for 60, 100 bucks a month, some are 160 bucks a month. So no Vermonter living paycheck to paycheck, which is what most Vermonters are doing, can possibly afford that. Um, but in any case, that's another story. I think another, <clears throat> I just wanted to comment after this is that from about 10,000 feet, as I listen to all this benefit stuff, the irony here is that we think of healthcare as a benefit and not as a need. And as I listen to all these 
added benefits and stuff. That's the general observation I got, and that's how perverted this system really is. And it's I know it's difficult to work in it, but I wish we could get over that benefit versus need. Healthcare is not a benefit. That's all I got. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks, Walter. Um, next, I'll go to Theo Kennedy. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm just a brief public comment slash question on the typicality test. I really appreci appreciate the work of the working group. And uh, just for context, I'm here as the chair of the Statewide Independent Living Council today as part of the Here Here Vermont Coalition. And we appreciate all the hard work of everybody. Um, you know, I, I find this excruciatingly, excruciatingly hard to understand, I'm sorry, between the CFR and the CMS guidance. So I'm I just very quickly, I'm relying on a CMS CMS or looking at a CMS guidance, uh, and we don't have to answer this today, perhaps it'll come up later, dated August 8th, 2019, specifically around the new state flexibilities. And at the very end of that memo, there, there, there's an attachment A with Q&As that CMS has issued. And the last one speaks to, it's number five, um, sorry, no, I've got to go further down the memo. It's number three at the bottom. It's saying compare the expected value of covering all of the benefits at 100% actuarial value in each EHB category of the typical employer plan or the comparison plan. So rather than belabor reading that text, um, are you going to have a subsequent session on how the typicality plan will be applied here? And is there any risk that the generosity test will not be applied? And this is the magic language. It says, quote from CMS, in the case of the generosity standard, we would not consider the state's proposed EHB benchmark to satisfy the requirement if the expected value for each applicable EHB category of benefits in the proposed state's EHB benchmark plan exceeds 100% of expected value for those same EHB categories in the most generous comparison plan. So if that feels confusing to you, join the club. But I, I just want to understand, is that, is that something that's going to be a part of the report that Wakely issues? And, and will that report be available to we members of the public? Yeah, so, so the answer is yes. Um, we were not planning on coming back to talk about the typicality test here. Because again, as I, as I mentioned, really, because we're not taking away benefits, substituting benefits. We're really just looking at the generosity test because we already have a, we already have a comparison plan really for that sets the typicality test. Um, okay. If we were to add, if we were to add these benefits, we would then have to find another plan, which is a little bit richer than our current be benchmark plan. At least this is how I understand the typicality test. I'm not an actuary. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have to then find a plan that was a little bit more generous than the plan that we currently have. Let's say if we added hearing aids, um, mm -hmm. you would then have to find a plan that was slightly uh, a little less, a little more generous than our current plan, match that plan, and then also show um, the federal government that you weren't exceeding the state employee health plan, which we had determined is our generosity. So it's kind of the way I had been looking at it is a floor and a ceiling, and the plan is in the middle, but what at least the new guidance from CMS has kind of uh, said is that it's really per, when you when you raise your plan up, you have to make sure there's another plan that's yeah. kind of equal in value. And I think the reason being is that they they want to make sure that there are other plans that are comparable comparable in the market, and there's not this kind of outstanding, very rich plan that exceeds all the others. So I think it's an effort by CMS to find some balance um, with the changes that aren't necessarily so generous that they're not going to be in line with other plans that are available in the market, but then not drop below any type of floor. Um, for instance, if you were taking away benefits or substituting benefits where your plan would then not be t uh, uh, equal to a typical employer plan in your state. Um, that, that, that's wicked helpful. If I could just have a brief okay. follow-up. So it, it's yep. really, we're talking about actual value. It's not driven yep. by any given benefit. And, Correct. And, and because yep. we're not taking out in this instance. Um, okay, thank you. I'm sorry if everyone else knew that already. I, I just, it's a little bit confusing to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Theo. Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment?
Hearing none, I, I wish to thank Emily and company for uh, the great presentation this afternoon. And um, we're going to next move to a discussion of the hospital budget uh, regulatory process and preliminary guidance. But does any board member need a break for five minutes? I see a shaking head, so we'll take a five minute break and we'll be back at uh, 2.36. Thank you. So it looks like all the uh, board members are back. I see Patrick is here. So I guess uh, we'll call this meeting back to order and we'll get st started with our discussion on the hospital budget regulatory process and um, preliminary guidance. And at this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Patrick Rooney, the head of the uh, finance team. Patrick. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can. All right, super. And uh, right now you should be able to see the title page for the slide deck up and Lori's going to be uh, driving that today. <clears throat> and so good afternoon, uh, board members, stakeholders and members of the public. Um, as uh, the chair alluded to, we are here today to discuss and provide some updates and progress on the uh, fiscal year 23 hospital budget guidance and also what the future may hold for the hospital budget process uh, as we've discussed internally here at the Green Mountain Care Board. And I say we are here uh, because um, <clears throat> we have an integrated team participating in this work this year uh, that you can see from that title page uh, um, includes uh, members of our legal team, our analytics and data team, ACO all payer model team, and uh, quality contingent of that ACO all payer model uh, portion of our regulatory responsibility. So uh, we have folks on the call today uh, to assist with questions and provide feedback uh, when we get to the discussion portion of the presentation, uh, because there are some components of this that are new. And there are people in this organization who can speak more intelligently about some of the finer points uh, than I can. So I will defer to them on uh, those specific areas uh, during the discussion portion, but I will provide an overview and uh, do most of the talking. So, <clears throat> Lori, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so this is kind of the order of battle today. We're going to cover uh, how we got to this point. Uh, we'll talk about uh, where we are presently. Uh, as I alluded to, we'll discuss the future of uh, where we think hospital budget guidance may be going and uh, also then open it up for uh, a board discussion in which we hope to have a robust dialogue uh, to get some of your feedback. So a couple of items to address here. Oh, Lori, uh, I'll throw an instruction to change slides. Um, a couple of items here to address before we get going is that uh, uh, regarding the 23 process, uh, we're still very early in this work, about three weeks or so working as a team. Uh, so the presentation today is simply meant to provide a kind of a check in on that and the plans for the future as well as the dialogue that I mentioned. So the talking points being presented are, are those that have reached a level of maturity where uh, their discussion and potential feedback uh, is prudent. Um, but uh, those listening should know that uh, there are other pieces in discussion internally uh, to help round out some of the guidance for public consumption in March of, of this year. And so uh, I'm sure there's, there's thoughts from the board too um, that aren't going to be in here, but that uh, this team is also thinking about, and that we'll have that come out in the discussion piece. Uh, next slide, please, Lori. So to kind of uh, recap and, and level setting us to uh, how we got here, this is our uh, high level timeline of how the hospital budget process works for those following along at home. This is the a relative time frame that we've followed uh, for many years now, um, with the one exception of the fiscal year 21 uh, process that occurred at the beginning of the pandemic and the board under emergency powers shifted around some of the dates to uh, accommodate uh, the uh, public health crisis that our hospitals were combating. Uh, other than that, though, we pretty much stick to this timeline, uh, which is set out in rule and statute for the most part. Um, and as far as specific dates go around presentations uh, for the hospitals and, and meetings for deliberations and decision and whatnot, that will be discussed in more detail when we get to that March presentation. Uh, and those dates have, uh, have been established. 
Um, however, on this, the one date that we can take away from this is the uh, preliminary budget presentation that we've scheduled for the 27th, which gives the board uh, an overview of what has been submitted for uh, our state's 14 community hospitals. Next slide, please, Lori. So uh, continuing with that uh, level set here is uh, a familiar look to many. Uh, it's the history of uh, net patient revenue increases year to year. Uh, you can see the most recent uh, decisions that were made provided for a 6.2% uh, increase in budget 22 over budget 21. Uh, that is the highest during the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, uh, time of regulation, however, much of that is the result of the environment that we have found ourselves in over the last couple of years and difficulty in accurate budgeting is a major component of that and <clears throat> so uh, there is uh, quite an increase there over the prior year um, and on the 31st of january this year i'll remind everyone um, the hospital audited financial results are due and we should be able to update uh, that 2.7 percent with uh, real uh, NPR growth uh, over the coming month or so as we receive those uh, submissions. Next slide, please, Lori. So continuing with that uh, NPR trend in the last uh, budget cycle, you will note that uh, charge increases are, are higher here, the weighted average being based on the uh, size of the uh, organization and their approved and submitted request. Uh, so you can see that we've had several, several years of uh, low submitted charges and low approved charges. And given the environment that we're in, we've started to see an uptick over the last couple of years, both in requests and board approvals. And so <clears throat> as we think about that for this year's process, and Laura, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we've put some items here uh, for themes that may surface this year, and this is something we've done over the last several iterations of uh, the budget process. Um, and some of these we've heard directly from hospitals. Some of these are continuations on themes from last year and the year prior to that. And some of these are also areas that are beginning to percolate nationally. And so <clears throat> as we migrate into that uh, 2023 discussion, uh, that level set is important. Uh, because we have an evolving situation in our uh, society and in healthcare in which we find ourselves relating to that public health crisis. And it's having a lot of impact on uh, the day to day existence that we have. And so <clears throat> we wanted to take uh, the opportunity to talk about some of those items. And if we if we go back 365 days, uh, most of us were uh, very uh, excited to be in line to get vaccinated and um, that was two variants ago, and Delta was uh, something that was in uh, the whispers in far off locations um, and hadn't quite descended upon us yet. So just to show how quickly things have changed for us, and uh, some of these items are going to continue to be, uh, have to be on our radar in future iterations of uh, the hospital budget guidance process and our, and our regulatory authority. Um, and we can probably expect to live in this this uh, uncertain space for um, the immediate future and, and a couple of years ahead in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic. So uh, talking about uh, some of those points and their consideration moving through this process as we begin to uh, outline guidance is, is going to be essential to uh, us creating a successful framework for this budget process. So some of those high level items, as you can see on the screen, is the ongoing pandemic impact that we've been living with, the potential transition to an endemic uh, situation, EIR and ED volumes continue to be volatile at these hospitals, overall real uh, unreliable utilization assumptions because of the ebb and flow of severity of the pandemic and the impact that that's had, uh, inclusive of the staffing challenges and burnout, socioeconomic challenges that come with trying to effectively recruit childcare, accessible child care, accessible uh, education opportunities for um, the families of folks who would like to move here, and traveling staff, uh, which has been a significant issue and grown more uh, significant over the last several months. We've seen a growth in both number of traveling staff and in the price of those staff and the cost uh, pressures that that is having on operating expenses and the bottom lines of our hospitals. 
Included in that are inflation pressures um, that continue, and that's occurring with travelers and supplies and really all elements of healthcare in general and in our daily lives. Um, just to illustrate that, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine a couple of weeks ago who had traveled to Los Angeles for a business trip um, about a month ago. And for those who know LA, uh, the airport is in kind of the northern part of the city near Inglewood and the port of Los Angeles, one of the largest ports in the world is in the southern part of the city. And his aircraft came in between those two geographic locations. And he said he looked out the window and as far as his eye could see, there are container ships that are probably taller than most buildings in Vermont. And it looked like uh, more of an invasion fleet um, than a global supply chain. So the logistics and costs are starting there and they're, they're uh, being incurred as um, that supply chain struggles to bring those goods to, uh, to consumer markets in the internal part of this country. And that is not going to subside with Omicron or any other variant. It's going to take time to uh, see those through. Um, we're also having uh, hospitals who are notifying us of capital plans and then having to uh, put those on cessation for a period of time until things calm down and they can return their energies to that work. Uh, we have the ongoing risk of 340B revenue, and we know the importance of that to hospital revenues as well as other operating revenues and some of the COVID uh, relief that's still trickling in. And we also have hospitals uh, specifically last year citing renewed strategic plans and budgets based on the activity that's occurring. So not a comprehensive list, but some of those items that uh, have popped up on our radar <clears throat> uh, over the last uh, year or so and recent and more recently in, in the last several months uh, with the rise of Omicron. Next slide, please, Lori. <clears throat> so some updates uh, as we move into the 2023 discussion. Again, um, we have this wonderful integrated team that's been working to populate some of these ideas and these work products. Um, that's part of an internal uh, work process that the Green Mountain Care Board has undertaken with regulatory integration. Um, we began to work on that in the ACO process this, uh, this last go around, and um, we're building that out further here in the hospital budget process and looking to take that a step further uh, with the future of hospital budget guidance. And many folks who have contributed to uh, the guidance discussion uh, currently are also contributing to uh, thoughts and uh, 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 RFP for the future of hospital budget guidance as well. So um, collectively, a solid group of people to, to work with to bring some of these ideas to uh, fruition. And what you're gonna see here, again, I'll reiterate, is not prescriptive. Um, we have various stages at which we're at in this process and some of the concurrent work products that we'll talk about. Uh, so there are going to be items that aren't on here that are important to us, also important to the board, um, that will uh, we'll begin to uh, mature as our discussions on guidance go on internally and, and with some of our uh, stakeholders that participate in this process. Next slide, please, Lori. Thank you. So first up is, uh, uh, work products from the data team that we're proposing for this year. And <clears throat> these additions, especially around the cost coverage piece, are a direct result of the sustainability planning work that's gone on. Um, the data migration and census work that I'll highlight here quickly are being incorporated to help inform the board of any potential changes at the population level. Uh, we heard the University of Vermont Health Network uh, stress some of that census information around Chittenden County over the past uh, hospital budget uh, process last year. And for anyone who was listening to the uh, Ambulatory Surgery Center discussion this morning, they also mentioned uh, changes in census at the Chittenden County um, level for their organization, the impact and necessity of accessible health care based on those fluctuations. So trying to fold this in to the overall discussion on appropriateness of budgets um, is an important step that uh, we support the data team on and the work that they've done here. So looking at these specifically with the uh, summarized cost and cost coverage by service line, again, using that Burns data uh, for the 23 process and adapting that um, uh, for uniform reporting uh, in the 24 process and onward and building that into our regular work product here. Um, 
the report on shifts in Vermont hospital patient characteristics using the VUDS and VCURES data, such as changes in NPR by patient, residence, payer, and service line, changes in paid amounts by patients, payer, hospital choice, et cetera. And then some of the census information to summarize changes in community characteristics uh, and converting that to the HSA level. So changes in overall population and its distribution, changes in socioeconomic status and its distribution, and the possibility to incorporate out-of-state demographics as well in that work. And I will have, uh, I will uh, divert to Sarah and uh, Jeff Batista, who I think are on the line uh, for any questions you may have on that, because as I discussed, this is not my forte. So uh, relying on those uh, sound uh, data mines, I will definitely defer to them. Next slide, please, Lori. ACO and policy changes. Um, <clears throat> this is one that uh, I will highlight as an area where we still have several discussions uh, to have, uh, but as far as what we have discussed, this is what's mature enough to kind of bring here to the discussion today. And it's a result of discussions that I've had with uh, Michelle Sawyer and Marissa and Sarah around the fact that we've asked a lot of questions in hospital budgets in the past related to ACO, and Michelle Sawyer was kind enough to do a crosswalk of the responses. and. It was uh, very disparate in, in nature and not super helpful in adding value to the discussion. So some of these are not just to inform, but to begin to tie um, the ACO and hospitals together more closely. And so data point number one, and I'll defer to Sarah Kinsler on specifics of this in the discussion session of this uh, presentation, but this HCP LAN alternative payment model framework and the importance of that, and you heard about it last week in Elena Barube's presentation, is that um, we're working towards categorizing these various types of uh, reform revenues so that we can be, do a better job of understanding that, that funds flow between the ACO and the participating hospitals. And again, this is a work in progress for the AVM policy team, and we're gonna meet on this um, in, the, in the coming weeks to discuss further uh, what the timeline would be on that deliverable. Um, but being a new concept to me, I, I can't go into a lot of detail, so I'll I'll defer to Sarah if you have questions on that. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, querying the hospitals to discuss ACO population health dollars received in reinvestments and improvements to quality and population health initiatives. This is a theme that percolated in the ACO budget process this past November and December, and we want to understand what's going on uh, kind of in that boots on the ground end user situation that the hospitals are in especially as it relates to the pandemic. Are, have these efforts been stalled in any way? Are you having a difficult time moving some of these initiatives forward because your attention is being drawn elsewhere? Or are you having successes in continuing to do this? And that's feedback that we really want to hear. Um, we also want to know overall hospital population health initi initiatives within the organization, their goals, their outcomes, things like progress that they're making, as I discussed. And also another element that uh, percolated in the ACO discussion is the FY20 settlement and the planned investment of those dollars in furthering the hospital's health care reform goals. So again, bringing that hospital and ACO piece a little closer together there um, for this process to understand and get kind of a health check on how those um, those health care reform efforts are proceeding. Next slide, please, Lori. Thank you. Uh, access quality and health equity. Um, we've heard a lot about all of these uh, lately, and uh, it's very important that we continue to have these discussion and provide a check in on where these are headed. So um, regarding access, <clears throat> um, this is an area of opportunity for us. Uh, again, this is something that came out of some of the pressures that the hospitals have been facing. We have this state wait times task force they're preparing the recommendations for February of this year. And our proposal here would be that we adopt the appropriate recommendations from that task force for this guidance. Now, whenever you have a group like this getting together with recommendations, there could be offshoots of work that come out of this um, that are the sole focus of subgroups. So when we get these recommendations, we wanna digest what's being put forward. Like what can we take action on for this year? And what do we have to kind of defer on and wait but should become part of the, the narrative and the work that we're gonna do for the future of the hospital budget process. And I've plugged in here also the alternative, which is to collect the third next available uh, wait time, which we've done in the past, we did last year. It's the current IHI measure 
it does have its drawbacks but where we could go with that if the recommendations that come out of the wait times task force are not something that we can take a lot of action on we would like to see something so that we can compare where they were last year at budget time versus where they're going to be this year so <clears throat> that's an area that we see a lot of opportunity in um, with that wait times task force and being able to find ways to um, get feedback from hospitals and uh, measure across hospitals in a relative way uh, some of the wait times that are being experienced so that the board can be better informed on that specific area of interest. Uh, next, we have a VPQHC Quality Framework Work Group. This kicked off yesterday. Uh, it is a, I was in and out of that meeting, but it is a, a broad array of stakeholders, and we have some here, VAS, the, some of the hospitals, Green Mount Care Board, uh, Membership, AHS, by state the HCA, Vermont Department of Health, and uh, DIVA, and recommendations for that are due out in August. It doesn't do us a whole lot of good for this process, and again, taking those recommendations and looking at the appropriateness of them, maybe perhaps we could build something out to request that data later on in the fall. We've done that with some items before in the hospital budget process to uh, get a feel for what's occurring there. Um, but we've put a lot of chips in the sustainability pot, and this is a direct offshoot of that. So this is where the best investment is right now and being able to uh, get recommendations and hopefully um, effective measurables across the hospitals. And that's something that's really eluded us in the quality space for some time. I don't think that's a secret, um, but this work group is really setting out to hopefully find some positive changes in that space so that we can begin to measure quality uh, across our various hospitals in a relative way. So <clears throat> moving on here, we also have uh, health equity. And this is uh, a new and very important concept in this process this year. Um, I think our intent here is to uh, get some questions out there so we understand what hospitals are doing. And hopefully some of the feedback of that can drive some questions from our counterparts at the HCA who probably have a bit of a leg up on us you know, on this specific area, but they are a necessary and appreciated component of this process. So we'd like to start wading into that space and bringing that awareness to the board and hopefully they can help uh, kind of take some of the feedback from there and, and drive some questionings uh, that they may have for the hospitals come uh, the time for presentations and the Q&A that occurs out of that process. So <clears throat> this is us trying to get an understanding. For example, here, uh, what are you doing as a hospital to recognize and correct inequities in your community and prepare for the development of health equity measures? And Michelle Degree was great at finding a report commissioned by CMS um, <clears throat> as a result of congressional action and RAND uh, put together a report around the coming health equity measures and approach and their definition is there on the screen. And so we wanna understand um, what hospitals are doing to prepare for that, what are they doing in their community? And we're not here to headhunt. Uh, so if they, if they are not taking any uh, steps in that arena, that's fine. Um, but we want to understand better about where they're proceeding on that uh, that plane of discussion. So something for evolution will probably build out more to that part as we continue through our hospital guidance process um, before we get to the March presentations. And any feedback that perhaps the HCA would like to give to us is going to be uh, very welcome once we start engaging with them as well on the guidance process. Next slide, please, Lori. So kind of rounding out the FY23 discussion, I don't think we could talk about it without addressing some of the challenges and opportunities that come with this year. And there's a lot of moving pieces out there uh, that are in play at various stages. Uh, I've uh, already discussed the sustainability, some of the sustainability offshoots that are already happen happening. Um, and we also have uh, pandemic related uh, changes that are occurring as well. And part of that is that the uh, state legislature is moving to help the Green Mountain Care Board continue with uh, flexibility in its regulatory role. Uh, and we also have the Health, Health Reform <clears throat> Oversight Committee accepting recommendations from a consultant around uh, the future of healthcare regulation in the state of Vermont. So 
there's a lot of moving parts right now. This feels very much like a transition year uh, for uh, healthcare regulation in this state, both internally here at the board and, and from uh, areas we might consider outside from state government. And so um, addressing some of those challenges uh, in this process this year is certainly a piece of that, but there's some more specific components that uh, we should weigh into as well. So. Um, COVID being one of the major one, the strain on hospital resources, um, but that constantly changing pandemic environment uh, also poses challenges to this regulatory process as we've come to know it and have experienced over the last couple of cycles. And so uh, being flexible and accepting the ability to be flexible uh, is something that's important. We've come to learn that being too prescriptive uh, in our work can cause issues down the road because things change and they change rapidly. We've seen over several cycles we'll be in this guidance process and things will be very, very dire. And then over the course of the summer, when we get to those August presentations, um, we're looking at a very different world uh, as it relates to healthcare and the pandemic. And then, you know, a couple of months after that, we have slid back into uh, some of the dark days of fall and winter as we all retreat inside. So. It's been very challenging to regulate in that space. And unfortunately, the data uh, that is coming out has been uh, all over the map, which uh, the consistency we've relied on has posed challenges as well. Um, so getting more specifically specific on some of the challenges, um, the cost outliers information from Burns, and there's a component to this later on that we'll discuss around uh, wanting some feedback from you all. Um, the data from 2022 is not generalizable in that uh, effectively 25% uh, of their year, that year they went without elective procedures. And so that's a major chunk of revenue that, and, and cost that was not borne by the hospitals as, as we've seen from the audited financial results. And in 2019, this was used in the sustainability work. That's the most reliable that we currently have, but admittedly it is it is aging out. We are in 2022 and we're looking one year ahead of that. So the discussion piece on that, we'll come to that in a couple of slides here. Um, quality data alike um, has the potential to be skewed by the challenges hospitals have faced um, since March of 2020. Uh, that situation has uh, arguably gotten worse um, in that time. And again, we have that VPQHC uh, stakeholder collaboration that is occurring that we've really put a lot of emphasis on. So um, looking towards the future, perhaps, and not so much this next year, but out from that and building that part out and taking those recommendations um, for the future of discussing quality da data in an intelligible and measurable way, um, I believe is a priority for the group that's put together um, these, uh, these components today. And so we have to ask ourselves, what resources do we want to put into quality, if any, this year? No, we may not use them again. So where's the value? Um, we have to ask ourselves that. And we've put quality on hiatus for the last couple of years um, to alleviate administrative burden. And with this uh, opportunity with VP, VPQHC, um, it might be best to continue with that, that effort of delaying the quality piece for another year as we explore that collaboration and the recommendations that are going to come out of that. Next slide, please, Lori. So despite those challenges, this is a great time to pilot some of the <clears throat> proposed and potential additions and changes for future use. Um, cost coverage being one of them, some of the census and market uh, census and uh, data uh, patient migration information, um, as well as the wait times information as well. Um, again, it does feel like a transition year for this process, and that's okay. Um, as we look towards the next several slides, um, that integrated G GMCB team working on the RFP is considering all of that uh, for uh, a contractor or consultant um, to have to consider as part of their review of our process, any recommendations they may bring out of that. So this is a good time to start doing some of this stuff. There are gonna be a lot of lessons learned um, from the pandemic and that trickles through to our regulatory processes and well, as well and what's useful to us in making our decisions. So it's a good time to start exploring some of those, um, those new data points 
and we'll take those back once we get through this cycle and we'll review them and we'll analyze them and we'll begin to refine those for future iterations of this process. Next slide, please, Lori. Thank you. So as I alluded to, there's some discussion points here <clears throat> that this is not an exhaustive list, as you can see at the bottom there, uh, but these are some areas that will really help guide our work towards that uh, public discussion in March and allow us to set expectations and uh, timeline deliverables for work products and helping understand, especially with some of these newer points around uh, uh, the cost outlier and market shift, you know, what year do you want to use and how do you want to use this information? Uh, because that will dictate uh, timelines for deliverables and who we deliver it to. So if it's something you want the hospitals to react to in their narrative, great. We know to deliver it to them and to put that in the outline for guidance. Do you want it for informative uh, information only, informative purposes only? Or do you want to use it for budget hear hearing questioning so we should send it to the hospitals and tell them to prepare for uh, discussions on those various uh, data points that our, our A team is going to uh, deliver for this process should you choose to want to move forward with that? And again, this is just kind of uh, uh, making sure we cover ourselves here, the access quality equity piece, the recommendations from the wait times task force. And I admit I'm not on the inside of the discussions there. So um, what I, I, I want to uh, uh, temper what I say here, um, that there may be components of that that are very well rounded and we could drive forward with in this guidance process. But I always like to be prepared for the fact that that may not be the case and I don't want to overspeak my place. Um, so would the GMCB want us to revert to third next available appointment as the alternative, although an imperfect one uh, for this process uh, so that we can have some sort of update on wait times or at least a snapshot of wait times um, that we can compare to a relative period last year. So that is really just uh, covering our behinds there to make sure that we're, we're doing our diligence, um, even though it may be an imperfect way to do so. So a couple of points to consider there as we move into the discussion piece later on. All right, now we're moving into <clears throat> uh, the future 20, 2024 and beyond. And as I stated, the, the many of the folks who are on this call to support this discussion have been working on this RFP. We published it yesterday. So if there are any contractors or consultants listening to this uh, dialogue here this, uh, this afternoon, there is a ease of access link there by which you can uh, access the RFP. And <clears throat> some of the high level goals and items for consideration here are to uh, that we want a contractor or consultant to do is to assess the current process. Um, really take in where what we collect and the decisions that we make, um, identify areas that we, we can enhance or modify GMCB uh, statutory authority and regulatory decisions and provide greater alignment with payment and delivery system reform efforts. So those are some of the high level goals. Um, there's certainly more specifics, as you can see in that RFP to some of that, uh, that requested activity there. And items for consideration, <clears throat> again, high level, uh, facilitate a stakeholder engagement. Um, an example of that would be, uh, what do we want, how do we want to measure um, the growth of the system or by hospital? Um, NPR has been one of the, the ones that we've used in the past, but we heard uh, from the UVM Health Network last year, they'd like to see us move to a per capita measurement. So uh, as part of the hospital stakeholder group, should that be a narrative that uh, the health network continues to want uh, to address, then that, that would be their opportunity to do so. Uh, but you can see here that there are uh, some examples of folks that we hope to engage in that stakeholder engagement to create a better uh, regulatory decision-making process and a more well-rounded one to help us address the, um, the healthcare system and <clears throat> those areas that we want to impact. Next slide, please, Lori. So continuing on that items for consideration, um, re uh, one of the things we would ask is that they review uh, related work streams and deliverables, provide recommendations on enhancing regulatory alignment and alignment with healthcare reform efforts. Uh, for example, sustainability planning, this is going to be a major component of what we'd like them to consider. Uh, regulatory alignment from the white papers that we produced internally, uh, HRAP and CON, as well as ACO and rate review. 
um, to kind of fold all of that in where possible to this process. Um, and if not, uh, also let that be known as well. Uh, integrate that stakeholder input with the current process, identify data gaps, how we can ease administrative burden, increase efficiency in our work, et cetera. That should always be uh, components of any good process and operation. Uh, recommend alternative methodologies. Here we go. Uh, hospital budget regulation with the goal of cost containment while improving access and quality of care. For example, alternative to NPR or per capita measurement, payment reform incentives, and data sources to support new methodologies and so on. And finally, consider current GMCB work around equity, access, quality and value-based care and affordability. There are, are, as we've discussed throughout this, there are components of that that are moving forward at various stages, and we want that to be folded into this process as well. Next slide, please, Lori. Thank you. So to kind of bookend uh, the discussion on this, we did publish the contract yesterday, or the RFP yesterday, excuse me, and not to get into the minutia of between then and what I have here on the screen, but we hope to have a contractor or contractors, if there are subcontractors, uh, on by late July, early August of this year uh, for observance of the 23 hospital budget process. Um, that's a pretty quick turnaround, but it's uh, definitely going to be to our benefit that we give them some uh, kind of a live fire exercise in how we go about this uh, current process. And we'll update the board with uh, further timeline specifics on uh, that, that contractor or contractor's work. It's probably going to be a uh, multi-year process to encapsulate all of this and get uh, much of this work and the recommendations and advice from them into place. Um, so we should be ready for that as well. Next slide, please, Lori. So that brings us to the end of uh, the slide deck and the team is on here for board thoughts, feedback, uh, or questions that we can answer. I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Would help if I took myself off mute. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, board members for comments or questions. Hi, this is Robin. I'll jump in with a couple things. Um, on the VPQ, this is more of a comment. Um, the in really in terms of the VPQ quality group that's um, moving it with the expected suggestions in August 22, it might also be a good idea for uh, the staff who are attending that group to communicate that. Um, to be thinking about that in terms of a potential next federal agreement where we will also have a quality framework. It may or may not make sense. Uh, Robin, somehow you got muted. I think she froze. Hopefully she doesn't keep talking. <laughs> Do you want me to hop and chat for a bit and then Robin can come back on, Kevin, or do you want to wait a minute? She might log off and log back on. Yeah, let's just see for, give her a couple of seconds and then we'll. Okay. Well, she doesn't seem to be leaving to come back on. So Jess, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> So I want to thank you, Patrick, and everybody else who was clearly involved in a lot of thoughtful consideration about how we move forward. Um, I want to say that I'm really excited about the RFP and the work streams that are outlined for a consultant to do. So I'm, I'm anxious and excited about that process. Um, a couple of thoughts I have. Um, I very much appreciate the incorporation in this year's analysis of the burns type data to understand cost and price variation. Um, I specifically think we should be looking at differences between inpatient, outpatient, professional services uh, separately, you know, and maybe looking at that in our regulatory letters separately. But having that data and having that incorporated in our decision making will be helpful. One of your questions was, you know, which year should we choose? You know, how do we do that? And I guess I would say, why do we have to choose a year? Um, if, if we can, if our 
team can, you know, access that data for 2020, we can look at it in the eye of what happened in 2020, but look at all the data that we possibly have, um, recognizing that 2020 is an anomaly. So, you know, looking at 19 and then carrying it forward as much as we can with data, I think will be helpful. So I'm not sure we have to choose a year, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, I really appreciated the, the attempt to integrate the ACO and the hospital budget process so there's tr stronger ties between the two. I think that's going to be really helpful. Um, I also really appreciated and I think we've seen how important it is to understand uh, community demographics, population changes, all of that in our hospital budget process. So I'm really uh, very grateful that we're kind of bringing that in a little bit more substantively potentially in this hospital budget process. Um, I think if we're going to use NPR as a lever, lever, even in this upcoming year, I recognize we have an RFP, we may dismiss completely with NPR in the future, but um, depending upon what the consultants say and a better process that we might endeavor. But I think at the very least for this year's upcoming budget, uh, we need to incorporate data, as you've said, I think Patrick, on patient migration, population size, that census information. I would also say adding to that this concept of rural bypass or where patients are receiving care. So we have some of the data on that. So it's not only who's in your community, but where are those community members seeking care? Um, and then I think also we have to understand uh, payer mix. Uh, more deeply uh, as it relates to cost coverage and even case mix and the acuity. So I think, you know, if we're thinking about NPR, we should be looking at NPR, but through the lens of patient migration, population size, rural bypass, payer mix, cost coverage, case mix, all of that has to kind of be part of it. I think that will allow us a more nuanced approach to, to our hospital budget process rather than just a straight one size fits all NPR target. Uh, with respect to quality, I, also very excited about the VPQ GMCB collaboration stakeholder engagement to try and figure out quality. I think um, one of the things I would ask that that committee to think about is volume standards. How do we think about volume? Because we know, and I've talked about this at a lot of hospital budget hearings, but volume quality relationships. So should there be volume standards, minimum value standards? And I do think, and I think I mentioned this last week in the meeting, at the very least, I think we should be tracking data on uh, mortality rates for things like heart attacks, strokes, GI bleeds, readmissions, surgical complications, and revision surgeries. And I think we need to be able to get that data even in small numbers. We can look over a longer period of time, three years or five years, to sort of smooth out outliers, but we need to be looking at that data uh, for even our smallest hospitals where sometimes, as I said last week, the hospital Medicare reports will just say not applicable because the sample size is too small. Well, let's look over a longer time period, but we can't not look. Um, with respect to wait times, as I think most people know, I actually am on that task force looking at wait times. And I guess what I would just say is the inquiry is well underway. There are gonna be some recommendations and I think our method of tracking wait times will probably need some adjustment. But I think if we hold out for a couple of weeks, uh, more information soon on that. And what was my last thing? Oh, my last point here, sorry, lots of sticky notes. I wanna make sure I catch everything. Uh, I do think perhaps this year it might be helpful to have a separate module or a series of questions around workforce. Uh, we know the workforce shortage is just, is just killing us, right? And so I think asking some questions, and again, I haven't thought specifically about these questions, but maybe the, the various teams can help us think through these, but you know, what have the recruitment efforts been? What are the costs associated with that? The travelers' costs, you know, what are turnover rates um, at hospitals? What are some of the efforts that are being done to help reduce those shortages? Right. So, you know, what 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 creative solutions have hospitals undertaken? Because there could be learning, <laughs> that, you know, there could be some incentives that maybe the board could create through the hospital budget process. Um, you know, one of the things we hear about is that there's not enough residency sites and internship sites and things like that. So, you know, could there be, but there's costs associated that, you know, for practices. So how do we, you know, ease that burden? Um, how many preceptors are currently taking students at each hospital? You know, how do we start to think about ways in which the board might be able to help through the hospital budget process to ease some of the costs associated with building up our, uh, our pipeline? So I'm not sure exactly what the questions are, Patrick and team, but I feel like this is a year where we, we should ask and un better understand 
some of the costs and some of the successes so that we can learn from it. And, and if there's ways that we can incentivize or help defray costs of improving our workforce shortage situation, that would be helpful to know and might be incorporated in hospital budget guidance. Oh, my last point, sorry, I do have one more point. And it's just thinking about, you know, so the sustainability planning report, as you all know, is due to the legislature February 1st. And I, but I think obviously, and you alluded to this, you know, the work has to continue. Um, and so our work isn't done just because the work is, you know, the report is being submitted to the legislature. So, and nor is the hospital's work being done. So I guess I would just ask, you know, the policy team and the data team and the hospital budget teams to think about how are we going to continue to incorporate that that planning effort and the learnings into the hospital budget guidance going forward? And I recognize that's part of the RFP, but what do we do it for for March, upcoming March? So those are all my thoughts and comments. Robin, are you back? She is. <laughs> all right. I was pinch hitting for you. Thank you. I wish I had heard all of you, so I would know if I'm being redundant. But unfortunately, the internet went down, so I missed a little bit before I could call in and get the internet back going. So, uh, Mr. Chair, should I jump back in? Absolutely, Robin. Okay, so uh, what I was uh, trying to say when I got dropped was um, in thinking the VPQ quality framework should be thinking forward as well to the Alpair model 2.0 agreement, which hospital level metrics may or may not be appropriate for. Uh, but it would be good to just have that in the back of the mind during the conversation so that we can ensure that we're aligning quality metrics as much as possible as we always attempt to do. So that was the end of that thought. Um, in terms of the other uh, discussion items that Patrick had on his slide 13, um, and I think I heard the tail end of just talking about this, um, it does make sense. I think the data issues are going to be quite a challenge this year. And so it does make sense to me to do something similar to what we did last year, where we look over multiple years so that when tw the bottom's out in 2020 and then we're looking at actuals in 2021 with the pent up demand, we can kind of see maybe uh, uh, what that ebb and flow looks like. Um, so that makes sense to me, but. Certainly, I would appreciate more thinking from staff on that. Um, and the other areas, I don't know. Um, I guess I'm not quite decided yet in terms of the use of the market shift and demographic datas and whether it makes sense to, you know, kind of pilot that to, to figure out the right use of it this year um, or exactly how to do that. I think it's a little bit tough not knowing where we're going to be in the COVID ups and downs. Um, so I think wherever we land in March, we'll, we may need to just be mindful as we get closer to the budget submission time that there could be another COVID surge and we may need to adjust. Um, so I'd love more thoughts or advice from staff on what they think makes sense in terms of uh, particularly this year, but also how that that information gets incorporated in a way that's useful. Um, the other area I just want to, this is really a question for, I think, for Sarah Lindbergh, um, although she can tell me if it's not. Um, and I know that in the past when um, when we UVM, and, UVM Health Network had brought up the per capita measure, um, we had talked about trying to think about that, and I know that Sarah had done some preliminary thinking about the data availability for that type of a look, um, and I'm excited that that might be something we can delve into deeper once we the RFP process is completed. But if Sarah could just talk a little bit about some of the work that she's done on that, I think it might be helpful in the discussion around um, moving forward. Hey, sure. Um, I will answer quickly and then I have to pick up my kids from daycare. Um, but uh, yeah, so the challenge that we have with any sort of thinking about per capita is just that, you know, we really are a state that has two major hospital referral regions. And so you know, that is complex when you think about it geographically. And so coming up with a denominator can be tricky. We also have the challenge of some of our hospitals serve um, a, quite a number of patients from out of state. And we don't have a lot of insight um, about that information. So um, 
thinking through both on a service line and on a data perspective, the way to um, come up with something like actionable is um, going to require quite a bit of thought. And I think stakeholder input um, in terms of, you know, what what we can reasonably and practically do um, to measure the signal there. But, uh, you know, overall, I, I, I also want to echo that I think that my advice is as we start to build this stuff out that, you know, thinking about systemic monitoring and kind of piloting tools is a really good way to think about it, in my opinion. Thanks, I'm all set. Okay, do other board members have comments or questions? I don't have much to say. I unfortunately and regrettably haven't thought about it as much as I should have. Um, <clears throat> but um, my, my, my basic sense is that 2023 for the hospitals is still going to be a tough year. It, it's not going to be um, stable. It's not going to be steady state. There's still going to be, you know, kind of recovering from this, this mass of assault. And so that, um, so that we've got to be very conscious about that, um, which I, I'm sure we are. But um, <clears throat> so my feeling is that, you know, if there are that we should be aware as we go through our budget process of what can we jettison? I mean, that that is something that we basically said we're going to go the data analytical route and, uh, you know, manage by uh, kind of more topside indicators than the grunt and grind of a you know, a uh, line item budget. And I, I think that 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 we should, um, you know, kind of, I'm not saying appease, but do whatever we can to show that we, we understand what their situation is. I think that um, we need to be uh, very aware of what goes on in the legislature um, during this time, because the legislature still has a lot of money to burn. And I just get worried that, um, that it begins to set up 24, maybe not 23, but 24 to a period where, you know, there, there just isn't enough fuel to keep doing um, um, what the kind of initiatives that the legislature might be supporting. And I don't know that there's anything specific. I just, that's an instinct of mine that, uh, that this kind of topside cost shift could occur that, you know, the legislature, it's an election year, they want, they want to be nice to the hospitals and, and they put things in place that just aren't affordable over the long run. And, uh, you know, I think we have to be aware of where those, uh, you know, those, those problems might exist. <clears throat> I think behind the scenes, we should be setting ourselves up for 2024. You know, obviously the all pair model was referenced, so that's kind of infrastructure. It's the infrastructure in place. Use the 23 to get the infrastructure in place that allows us to, you know, become more uh, aggressive um, uh, in in 2024. So things like this FPP rule that we're working on, you know, we don't, you know, we don't have to do that front and center. We can do it behind the scenes, um, you know, uh, so so that it's in play. You know, when we're at a point where the hospitals can. Kind of take on uh, more of a participation, you know, in th in change. Um, I I just don't think that uh, um, you know that the, they're going to be ready for much change, except leave leave me alone kind of change, you know, in 2023. And so we should use that space to set ourselves up structurally um, for for 24. And there's there's a lot we can do. I'm I'm listening to uh, Jess and. And Robin and 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 you know all of that is good stuff, but I I I think the target should be 24 as opposed to 23. I I think burnout. Um, they're still going to have staff shortages. They're still going to have workforce shortages, and so it's not like we're going to be entering the 2023 process with hey we're back to normal. We're going to be far from normal, and uh, um, and um, but that that that's just my general top side thought is to play defense with the legislature, you know, be aware of what they're doing and 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 have a an eye toward it that is if this thing rolls out in 24, 25, we put it back in the box, um, or are we going to be stuck with it? Um and 
that do all the kind of infrastructure stuff that we can kind of off the screen, trying not to burden the hospitals with it, uh, but getting it in place, you know, maybe with this consultant help as well. Um, and then be very conscious about identifying stuff that we can jettison, you know, that we're, we could just say to them, you know, we're going down this path and it's going to require this effort, but we're not doing this stuff anymore. And because uh, I, I, I agree with managing by you know, some of the top top side analytics. It's, it's a nice competitive way to uh, kind of move, move, move down the court where there's a lot of peer pressure is in terms of, uh, you know, um, the relative standing of hospitals and funding and case mix and population and all those kinds of things. So that's my very crude, uh, that, that, that crude uh, observation at this point. And I, I promise next time I'll be a little bit more specific. Thanks, Tom. Are there other comments or questions from the board? Yeah, just a just a couple and and um, realizing that I'm new and, and not fully informed with all that's gone on before. But um, taking a look at what you've mentioned today, Patrick, um, it's causing me to reflect on what I've seen in other large organizations and other places. Um, and there are some great things that you're talking about, right? Like um, integrating more utilization and quality data. That's that's a key thing. But to um, in a value-based environment, we want to kind of move away from an assessment of charges and reimbursement only. Right? When we look through just that lens, it creates views of about cost shifting and work forcing, uh, workforce issues that can be roadblocks to further change. Using a different assessment methodology that's more service line cost based and per capita reimbursement types kind of frees up our thinking about some of those issues and we find more flexibility and more ways of going forward. Um, I think small number wise, a, a comment there, um, statistical significance is not the same as clinically meaningful. So don't be afraid of the small numbers, right? We'll still learn from them. We're not trying to find statistical significance all the time. We're trying to find meaningful things that help us think about the future. And we can remember these are small numbers, but we, we, it's, that's, don't be afraid of the small numbers, I guess, is, a, is something that I wrote down. I think um, integrating the census data is, is important um, because of what it helps us to do with equity measurement, right? Um, I'll, I'll use an example from the meeting that we had just a few moments ago. Um, I wanted to ask, I, I tried, I think I did it poorly, and then I thought about a better way to do it later. but. One of the questions for the group, for the presenters in the last group, I would have liked to say, um, what proportion of Vermonters have difficulty with their teeth to the point that it requires more than two preventative visits a year? What proportion of Vermonters require or want IVF treatment? And of those two groups, which of the two groups contains more poor Vermonters? And are we doing everything that we can to, to, from an equity standpoint, provide more for the poor Vermonters? Right? And, and you get that information from popular, you, you need denominators and populations in order to be able to do that. Um, just looking at my list. And one thing, um, one thing that the last couple of years has really pushed my thinking on, I've spoken a lot and written a lot about quality measurement and patient perspective and patient reported outcomes. Um, while our healthcare system is really on fire and there are people providing care to patients, and it reminds me of time that I've spent uh, with a search and rescue unit and fighting uh, wildland firefighting in California, if I'm in the middle of a fire looking for lost people or shoveling dirt and somebody comes up to me and says, you know, if you hold the shovel a little bit different, you could go faster. I'd want to hit them with the shovel, right? And so we've got to realize that they're in a fire 
And sometimes we need to think about how do we change the overall structure of the environment to have less fires, right? And and and, and so I just want to the my point with that little story is to think about workplace um, quality and and wellness. Like, are we putting pressures on workplaces that encourage burnout or are telling people um, hold the shovel faster and go, different and go faster? Like, are there quality of employment measurements that we could be looking at as, as well? So that's all. Thanks for all the work that you've done. And um, thanks for all that you're doing to try to integrate these different measurement streams. Kevin, you're on mute if you're talking. No wonder why nobody ever answers me. Yeah. <laughs> I just asked if there was any uh, follow up uh, comments or questions from other board members. If not, I'm going to move to public comment. Uh, members of the public commenting on the uh, hospital budget guidance. Walter. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I want to thank Tommy Walsh for his comments, especially about the fire. Uh, and the shovel he was going to bing somebody with if they told him to hold the shovel differently. Uh, as a guy who has held many shovels and dug many holes and been told that many times, I almost did that once. Um, as someone, as Tommy's phrase about the, or Tom's phrase about the dental, about what percentage, I think a good thing to do would just go into like a, a normal Walmart store and just roam around the Walmart store and watch all the people with terrible teeth and bad health conditions and the conditions of poverty that are there. Um, and there's more places where you can do that. Um, I have most of my mouth is dentures, in fact. I just got bad genes and my teeth just rotted out. And I had no insurance because dental insurance in Vermont in America is just ludicrous. Um, <clears throat> back to Tom's um, about workforce. I think Tom did hit the hit part of the problem. And you can go to any number of quotes from UVM, for example, nurses being on strike, um, burnout, they're they're about to that they're about to strike again, um, the traveling nurses versus the regular nurses, and see how this American sort of business model where employees are treated as nothing but resources. Um, <clears throat> plays out and what it's doing. And this is the problem with treating healthcare as a factory. You know, we talk about payer mixes. I listen to this and I often think, what are we running, an auto dealership here? And Tom's points are valid in that regard too, because that's a great deal of what's going on. And it's that, it goes back to that shovel metaphor that Tom talked about. So I'll I'll let others go now, but that you know that's that's kind of what's it. Thanks, Walter. Next I'm gonna to turn to Mike Del Treco. Um can you see me and hear me? We can. Perfect. Uh thank you. So first I just want to start out by saying thanks to the board and the budget team or I guess teams working on the guidance this year. I found the presentation to be um, refreshing and the questions um, uh, discussed are certainly important. I have a, a, I guess I have several points to make. Um, first, I just kind of want to uh, take a moment to recognize some accomplishments uh, uh, that, is, that have happened. As, as pointed out in slide four and five, we have, as measured by net patient service revenue, bent the cost curve, and we've actually bent this quite significantly. I say that because net patient revenues certainly have a direct impact 
on premium inflation. Depending on how you measure this, um, you come up with billions of dollars from where we would have what we would have spent to where what we are spending today. Um, premiums certainly are part of hospitals net patient revenue. I clearly know our work's not done, but again, I wanted to recognize that accomplishment. Um, I like I you know I want to also say I enjoy working with Patrick and the team, and I know we have certainly certainly have many challenges ahead of us. Um, and I have seven more additional points to make. Um, they're short um, and they're just uh, informative and maybe we have some opportunities here. Um, let's keep this process as simple as possible. Carefully determine how new requests would be used before adding it to the budget guidance. And we must in, uh, understand what could be eliminated from the process as well. Let's remain consistent especially as we move year to year. If we continually change what we're looking at, it's very difficult to measure success. Let's create a clear understanding of how budget decisions will be made. Let's recognize costs outside of hospitals control, specifically workforce expenses such as travelers and other inflationary pressures such as pharmacy costs. Let's not forget about how important it is for hospitals to have operating margins, not just to cover the extraordinary pressures they face today, but it's equally necessary for investing in technology, workforce, other staff, healthcare reform, in infrastructure, uh, you name it. As always, we need to balance affordability with the appropriate growth necessary that, that to afford for more funds with the high quality and equitable access to care they deserve. And finally, as mentioned, we need to continue to be flexible as we never know whether this pandemic might take us or what we might face down the road. Um, again, I really appreciate the board's work, uh, Patrick's and, and the team's work here and uh, look forward to continued working on this with the group. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Mike, uh, do you have any specifics as far as what you, um in, in your mind, what you're thinking of as unnecessary collection? Um, you, you know, I like like let's take a take a moment. We we had a, a discussion here about sort of. I have an echo, I'm, so it's a little bit difficult. Yeah, I'm not Tom sure. Bellum, it's uh, coming through oh. your line. If you could mute. Go ahead, um, Mike. We talked about important things like measuring workforce and measuring. Um, statistics around workforce is that a is that a budget process or is that a work, workforce uh, task force process? I don't know, but but what are we trying to accomplish in the budget versus what are we trying to accomplish in um, in uh, it, outside of the budget process? I just think it's important to to recognize those those things. I'm not, and I'm actually not pointing that out as a problem or, or a, a, a good purpose. I just, it's an example. Okay. Uh, and I'll just throw back at you that uh, um, your hospitals may want to be talking about the workforce as they justify their uh, budget. So it's a, it's a circular thing here about. Uh, yeah, um, careful, careful um, how we talk about that. What I was talking about the, the, interesting statistics um you know we could look at all of the interesting statistics um or we could look at um the new cost associated to travelers really s simple questions um but ones looking at new statistics and how they impact things is much more difficult for hospitals to gather and report in a budget cycle as opposed to saying I have 20 new travelers and the cost associated with those travelers has increased X, Y, or Z. And, and so I'm not minimizing your uh, point, um, but like what are we trying to accomplish through the statistics or data gathering and how will it be used um, is really my my message. And again, it's not meant to say it's right or wrong. It's it's meant to say, let's be thoughtful of how we um, add or even take away things. Okay, next I'm going to turn to Kathy Fulton. Kathy? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Mullen, and thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can. Terrific, thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to follow up on Patrick's presentation, I think um, in slide 10, where he mentioned um, the VPQHC's uh, work group for the quality framework, as he said, uh, we kicked off yesterday. Uh, we're very excited about this work. Um, we've had uh, a very well attended. Uh, we invited over 40 partners and had um, 34 attendees with a few folks um, just not able to per participate due to schedule conflicts. But in addition to the partners that Patrick mentioned, um, I'd include the medical society, insurers, and um, hospital representatives from UVM, Copley, and North Country, and, and others, other um, you know, key stakeholders. And I believe um, from Elena's presentation last Friday, uh, I think it might have been Robin mentioned uh, Drs. Dupuy and Dr. Macy from Copley both were in attendance yesterday. So we're very, very pleased with the expertise around the table and very excited to, to be starting this work. We'll be adding the Health Equity Office and um, community members from uh, the folks we serve as well. Uh, we, we're ensuring there's a very diverse set of interested parties for sure. Um, our QI specialist, Ali Johnson, is the project lead for this work. And we'd just like to encourage everyone to, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to either Ali, myself, or Hillary if you have thoughts or um, suggestions for us. We'll be providing all of our working documents um, on um, for the for the work group. We'll be working on shared documents in a secured portal, but our final documents will be posted on a public facing website. Um, I don't believe I can post that into the chat for this meeting, but we can get that link um, over to Kara, and <clears throat> hopefully Kara could share that link of the information. But, we'll make sure that happens. Uh, okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, but we yesterday got into an overview of our process and timeline, um, the intentions of uh, everything we expect to accomplish over the next five months. And um, you know, as as always, we're very happy at any time to present our progress to the board, as you would see fit throughout the, throughout this work. A Additionally, on um, slide 10 of pa Patrick's presentation, we have a separate project, um, the Vermont Hospital Health Equity uh, Project, that we'll be starting um, later in the year, uh, starting kicking off in the fall. Unfortunately, we've had to postpone that work because of the current situation we found ourselves in, you know, the hospital, the crunch at the hospitals and um, certainly the impacts to uh, staffing and, and surge capacity. But we'll be um, supporting hospitals with a system to implement, help implement strategies at system levels uh, within the organizations to advance health equity at each organization. And we're looking to include an organizational assessment and gap analyses for this work. Um, and we'll be looking to form up a steering committee with hospital representation. So that's additional work that, um, uh, as Patrick uh, referenced on his slide, that we'd like you to be aware of and can keep you posted on. Okay, thank you very much. Is there other public comment? Other public comment? If not, thank you, Patrick. We have a, a lot to talk about. And uh, at this point, we're going to go on to uh, old business. And I'll kick that off by um, just mentioning that we are going to have a open public comment period on our website for the earlier discussion on the essential health benefits plan. So if anybody wishes to make uh, comments, um, that uh, public comment portal will be open until Friday, February 11th. Is there other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Is, 
is there a oh did somebody say something no is there a motion to adjourn so moved second it's been moved and seconded to adjourn all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed signify by saying nay Thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of the day.